live. All right, we should be live. I know it takes a few seconds to pop ever everywhere, so I'm just going to double check on YouTube um, and LinkedIn. Also, for anyone already watching, um, you know, links to well, well, we're going to talk about Jacob in a second, but links to all of his social and stuff is down below as well uh, in the description on YouTube. And all right, we're live on LinkedIn. Looks like we're live on YouTube. Welcome. I see, already see quite a few people here. Uh, we're going to wait just a minute before we really get going in. Uh, but first of all, I want to say thank you for everyone who's joining in. Uh, feel free to say hello in the chat. And it's also fun to maybe, you know, say where you're watching from. And if you want to throw in more information about um, maybe why you're interested in learning more about combining LLMs with computer vision, that'd be great to hear as well. And we'll get going here in just a minute. But uh, thank you so much, Jacob, for uh, coming on to the stream. My pleasure. Happy to be here. It's uh, it's an honor to be a part of the robust and responsible AI community. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And while we're waiting, I'll also share a link in the chat. It should also be in the description below on YouTube as well. Um, but uh, Voxel 51 has a great sounding event coming up in September which I might be a little biased because I'm also at the event, but I want to share it in the, in the chat as well to make sure anyone who wants to register uh, can find that. I'll share it on LinkedIn as well. And all right, so I'm going to kick off just some intro and introduction, and then we'll get going into uh, the fun content. So my name is Sage Elliott. I'll be the host today for, um, for today's Robust and Responsible AI event. We're a community of AI and machine learning practitioners, research, researchers, designers, and much more kind of anyone who's working in AI um, can come and you know, learn from our Slack community, which again, link to that is uh, in the in this in the description below as well. Uh, but also, you know, we do a lot of events of bringing people from the community on, talking about what they're working uh, uh, with in the industry, like today's event, which is really exciting. And you can kind of think of today as kind of a live podcast. So uh, I bring in a guest, we interview them starting with specific topics, and then, you know, feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go, uh, depending on time and, you know, the rabbit holes we go down, we, we may or may not get to all of those, um, but you can always follow the guest, um, again, the links to their socials in the description and uh, potentially ask those questions later. And I always want to say, if uh, if you'd like to come on for an event, uh, let me know in the Slack channel or on LinkedIn. If you have an interesting story to tell or something you're working on, I'm usually happy to have a guest on today. And so today we have our guest, Jacob Marks, with us to talk about combining LLMs with computer vision, which I think is a really exciting topic. I love computer vision. I like LLMs. You know, uh, both are really interesting right now. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with them together. But before we really get started with that um, question, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Jacob? Maybe you let us know an overview of your background. I know it's really cool because I've looked at your LinkedIn. And uh, <laughs> um, I always like to hear a little bit about how you maybe became interested in the data and ML field as a whole. And then maybe just a little bit about what you're working on. Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Jacob. I'm a machine learning engineer and developer evangelist at Voxel 51. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about Voxel 51 shortly, so I won't go too much into that right now. Um, my background is actually in physics. So this is my first job in industry. Uh, before this, I was doing my PhD uh, in physics at Stanford, where I focused on condensed matter theory. So I was looking at quantum phases of matter, especially uh, topological phases of matter. Uh, so the stuff I do right now is super different from that. Uh, it is also exciting and incredibly cool in its own way. Uh, I it feels like I've lived two different lives almost in this case. Uh, but the thing that got me interested in data is uh, I, I used a lot of like high performance computing, like, you know, analyzing large amounts of data through the scientific work that I was doing in physics. Uh, but I also, during my PhD, had the opportunity to do a couple of internships. And one of those internships was actually at a very small company uh, called Joint Point, which has since been purchased by a subsidiary of uh, Johnson & Johnson. And I was interning there in an imaging engineer capacity doing, at that point, because it was a few years ago, more traditional computer vision, image processing stuff. So a lot of like uh, traditional edge detection and uh, grayscaling and like, you know, very, very simple things, uh, which now you know, a lot of those techniques are obsolete. Some of them are still useful in many cases, actually, but some of them are obsolete now. Uh, but I got super interested in 
the ways that this geometric physics and math mindset can actually come into play in analyzing and, and uh, doing computer vision work. So that, that's my background and what drew me here. I think the, the thing that drew me to Voxel 51 in particular is uh, the company is uh, has the goal of bringing clarity and transparency to the world's data. And I, I, I'm totally on board with that mission. I think that it is incredibly important for us. And, and as you know, a robust and responsible AI community, as, as people who are interested in monitoring and observability and all of that, I, I'm sure that you feel the same way. Uh, I think that there is so much importance in understanding the data that goes into the models and uh, making things not just black boxes, but explainable and interpretable. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. <laughs> yeah, I liked what you talked about too, with the, the more traditional computer uh, vision techniques. Like, I don't know if you're using uh, OpenCV or uh, building um, your own libraries for it, but and they, and they are still useful. Like you're saying, there's still use cases. Like you don't always need deep learning. I mean, all the cool stuff that's happening right now with computer vision is probably using deep learning. But sometimes you can just use a lightweight library or uh, something you build your own and do things like edge detection. And maybe that's all you need. And you don't always need to try to cram deep learning into everything. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. I think there's a tendency these days to just go for the next hot thing uh, and to think that you can smash every nail with this big massive hammer that we have. But sometimes you don't really need that. And it's actually better to use the like, you know, custom, like tailor built tools, uh, things that we actually understand, things that are maybe smaller and uh, like, built for that uh yep. I'll, again i'll stop here <laughs> <laughs> no no it's good i like uh hammering that point in too because some people especially if they are newer to the industry it's so easy to just get caught up in the ml um hype which is real but yeah there's you know look at these other traditional te techniques sometimes and uh yeah so uh, a, a big thing about that is like if you need a smaller um computer vision model and you want to run on edge device and if you're just doing something kind of simple you know you might not need deep learning but also all these edge devices can run like uh, deep learning models now. So if you do need deep learning, uh, um, you can maybe fit it in. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so most people watching today have probably used some sort of LM so far, uh, mainly ChatGPT, if not any of the other amazing ones that are out on like Hugging Face and all these cool places now. Um, how did you first get kind of started or in introduced with LMs? And do you remember like when you thought, oh, this is going to be really interesting. There's going to be really cool stuff we can do with this. Yeah, yeah. So I think my exposure to and my excitement with LLMs uh, was uh, a multi-step process. So I, I began with like ChatGPT, as many people did. And part of my job as a like developer evangelist is putting out educational content blog posts, tutorials, stuff like that. And so I was looking at uh, just using the traditional chat interface, like way, way back when, when the chat GPT came out, if it could answer questions about computer vision and programming. And I was just probing its knowledge, trying to see if it would write working code for me to solve basic computer vision things, uh, whether it understood how to do basic machine learning tasks, um, things as simple as backpropagation, but you know, obviously then going and seeing how far we could take that. And this is before I really understood. And I think before a lot of people really had dug into prompt engineering. And it was certainly before I was going and actually accessing this via an API and doing any testing and uh, you know, all of that fun stuff. Uh, but my initial impressions were that it was very cool that it could even answer some of these things correctly. Like I, you know, before this, I, I had worked very, very briefly with some NLP and I hadn't seen anything that could uh, answer any type of sophisticated questions in this way. Like it could write for you a uh, simple code that was almost like, like template boilerplate code, but it couldn't actually do anything that required some more like mathematical understanding. And in some cases, ChatGPT was able to do that. Of course, ChatGPT initially GPT 3.5, like through that, like chat interface is limited in and of itself. It's, it's gotten better or depending on who you ask, better or worse, it's changed. Uh, but I, I think that my, the point at which I was really impressed was when GPT-4 came out uh, and I started to ask it if it could understand uh, our query language of Voxel 51. And it was just using data that it had from the internet. And our 
query language is only a few years old. So I was really surprised that it had any understanding of it. And I was able to not deterministically, but every so often I was able to get it to actually write working code to uh, do a query of a computer vision data set for me. And I was thinking about how there wasn't that much sample code it was going off of. So it was really just using a lot of inference at that point. And that's what really got me thinking about what these models could do. The fact that they're they're not just regurgitation machines. They're not just um, like things that can take what they've seen and spit it back to you or spit it back in a slightly modified context. They have some inference. They have some reasoning capabilities. And, and that's what I think that people are really running with or should really be running with now. That's a really cool story around... Uh, having inference because like you know most people know the training knowledge was cut off what was it uh 2021 at some point and so having something where you're like well there's a little bit of knowledge like it knows some of it but it has to put all these those these things together with the rest of the knowledge it has because unlike you know when i ask it something to do uh like adjust something in pandas or something like that it knows right off the bat probably from stack overflow because everyone's asked this question you know a million different times uh, but it's still really cool to see like work with my exact code sometimes but yeah that's such mm -hmm. a fun use case too <laughs> um i was gonna ask the same thing about computer vision but i think we covered a little bit on your intro about how you got yeah, into it yeah. uh do you have anything else you want to add though about like why you're really excited about computer vision i think that computer vision is still a bit nascent. Like we've we've gotten to the point where people have pretty good object detectors and segmentation models. And like they, there's a lot of the, the basic image manipulation tasks that you can basically choose. Like you have your pick of a bunch of off the shelf models and you might have to fine tune them. Like if you actually want something that works at state of the art quality for your particular application, you're going to need to figure out how to change it, whether, you know, fine tuning it with data augmentation. Uh, maybe you need to even modify the model architecture to some extent, but we, we understand the basics and we have basic building blocks that work pretty well for a lot of these, uh, these different machine learning tasks in computer vision. I think that I'm really excited for what comes next. So I'm excited for now, how do we put these into a bunch of cool applications that almost like, what is the what is the ChatGPT killer app for computer vision? Like, how, what, what are we going to see? What are we going to be seeing in the near future? Uh, I mean, we've seen like people use these models to generate uh, professional grade headshots. So you could just have a picture of yourself and it'll like create a headshot. Or we've seen a bunch of filters on TikTok or Snap or wherever else, but those aren't quite ChatGPT level. Uh, so what are what's going to be the thing that's going to take all of these advances that we've had in computer vision over the past X years that are pretty good and put them together in a way that is actually useful and valuable to everyday people. Yeah. And I see, um, and, and we were talking a little bit before uh, we went live, but how I've worked in computer vision before too. And so I've, I've just seen, I've been around um, in areas where I've seen a lot of interesting use cases and there's a lot of really cool stuff with computer vision out in the field today and that people are working on and like, you know, like agriculture, um, uh, medicine, like all these fields that people don't always necessarily think about. Uh, but if you can have a computer vision model do something sometimes even like, you know, a percentage better than a person or as a double check on some sort of um, medical scan or something like that. I think there's so many really cool things that are just out today actually making a big difference, which is really exciting. And um, totally, totally. And like you said, and we're going to go in, I think, with the fun conversation around combining all the, all these technologies. Uh, but just like most animals, I mean, having computer vision as an interface to the world makes so much sense for the rest of AI. So if you do want an LM, uh, which is going to be the next question, but if you do want an LM to interact with things in the real world and understand what's going on, you'll probably want some sort of um, computer vision as the, the input sensor to understand like the state of things where it's in, which is really, really interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited for uh, to see where this goes next and like combining everything that we've learned in the last couple of years with LMs and and uh, uh, yeah, so I'm excited to get to the next question, <laughs> which uh, the main topic today is uh, combining LMs with computer vision. Um, so maybe you could start by diving in uh, with some of the use cases that you find interesting. And I know you've done some cool work at Voxel 51 uh, with this as well. But do you have any use cases? I mean, we, we just talked about our excitement around like all, combining all these things. Um, do you have any use cases that uh, come to mind right now or, or a couple that you'd want to mention that are, are really cool that like combining these technologies could allow us to accomplish? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
backing up just a second. So Voxel 51 is a company that helps people to build higher quality data sets so they can build higher quality models. Uh, so we're right now working primarily in the computer vision space. So image, video, DICOM, point cloud, all those fun types of computer vision data sets. Uh, and it helps you to understand your data better, visualize it, find edge cases, uh, find places where your model may be underperforming. Uh, and then with those insights, go to build better data and better models. The things that we do using large language models are all in service of that. So it's helping people to understand their computer vision data better and to then build better models using that. Uh, the applications I've seen more broadly that are pretty cool using LLMs plus computer vision are things that many of you might also have seen. So there's little demos of like people using a Furby and they'll like, you know, they'll, they'll make the Furby, they'll like talk to it and the Furby will use these GPT type models and then it'll speak back to them. Um, that's like this embodied intelligence, intelligence in, in you know, very strong quotes. Uh, people have done similar things with vision models where they've given models that have some cameras on board. Uh, maybe it's just a single camera, maybe it's multiple, maybe they're like multiple different types of devices and they are giving it uh, some type of language capabilities as well. And we had an example of this, I think from Google last week where there was a uh, a, a robot that was asked to pick up the uh, like the toy of an extinct dinosaur. And it was able to infer based on uh, its existing knowledge, which of the things was the extinct animal. And then it was able to then use the vision systems on board to combine that with language and pick that up. And, and that's you know a, a testament to the many technologies involved, the, the large language models, the vision systems, the robotics that was involved in that, uh, and the engineering that went into uh, actually combining all of them. I, I think that what we're gonna be seeing more and more though is, and the thing that I'm super excited about is not just individual image and individual stream processing, but the ability to use large language models to make edits to data sets in mass. Uh, and I'll go into some applications of that in, in the, you know in the rest of this conversation, but that's something that we are working on at Voxel 51 is you, you have these models and you have your data and it's very easy. You can even in, in BARD or in chat GPT upload an image and have it detect things for you or have it tell you about that image. But where do we go from there? Like what is, what can you actually do beyond just taking these, a single image? Uh, how, how can it actually integrate with your entire data stack, like your, your, all of your, your data stores and do things with that. Uh, so that is where I see the future going, being able to, to integrate almost like hugging GPT style. You have a, a whole cast or, or, or this, this set of, of instruments at your disposal, or tools at your disposal. And then you need to integrate the data as well and figure out how to, as an agent, utilize the data and these models to accomplish some tasks, which is I don't I don't think we're quite at that point yet where people are doing that in in a like a, a fashion that it will be able to eventually. Yeah, it's really exciting um, seeing all these AI applications with LMs almost kind of helping you build better AI. It's a fun loop that I've been noticing a lot in certain demos and stuff, and I don't think it's going to stop any anytime soon. Uh, so it's fun just seeing like integrating all these things together and seeing how how we can help you build you know, potentially a better LM or a better computer vision model. It's really interesting <laughs> to, when you like stop and think about it. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, and yeah, uh, it's a cool cycle. And uh, yeah, there's some really cool applications like you were saying with, uh, I think, understanding images. Like I've seen, you know, demos tying computer vision models with an LM. Like you were saying, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So there's probably like a segmentation model and all these different things. And you could ask it like, you know, is there an apple in the tree, uh, not on the ground, but in the tree and understands that like, oh, yeah, like tying these things together. And we've seen some of these in the past with like recurrent neural networks. But I feel like the where LMs are right now are so much more powerful. And there's so much more understanding of just the world as a whole versus like whatever you trained your RNN on before. Um, that is not just some little bit of context awareness. It actually brings so much context awareness if you're doing something or using something like a GPT-4. It's very interesting and so excited to see where all those things go in the future. <laughs> um, totally, totally. And before we go even further into, because I def definitely do want to get more into the um, awesome stuff at Voxel 51 with it. Uh, but so you've been building an, an awesome sounding uh, product with LMs and uh, computer vision. So what what has that been like, like putting those things together? And uh, do you have any 
advice for practitioners who want to do something similar? Yeah, yeah. So any, any or like any tools you like that you want to give a shout out as well? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, the tool that we've been building, the the large language model enabled or powered application, uh, is called Voxel GPT, and I'm sure we'll talk about that shortly. But the the process of building that has been really fascinating. Um, I've I've learned so much about how these models interpret things and and where their uh, their gaps are and trying to kind of push them into a specific format. Um, now, of course, there's if you're working with ChatGPT uh, via OpenAI API, now they have this function calling interface, which makes things a lot easier. But it's still not always a great fit. Like it, it's still somewhat limited. And if you have much more complicated functions that take a lot of parameters and and have uh, a whole variety of of ways that they can interpret things. So, um, for instance, an example is a lot of the uh, the query language that we have at Voxel 51 of our, our 51 tool set, uh, it works both for images and videos and the syntax to actually have the same methods work for images and videos can be super different. So you have to almost like create a pseudo syntax that you then feed into these models that allows them to interpret it without getting confused and then translate it back into the correct syntax at the end of the day. Uh, the, the, the overarching lesson from this is that like, these LLMs are just tools as, as everything else is in, in software engineering. And, and the best way to, to approach them is not to treat them as uh, like magic, uh, you know, they're going to solve all your problems, but to try to figure out where you can utilize them. Uh, the, like, the key areas where they allow you to do things that other tools that exist may not allow you to do either uh, because it doesn't exist otherwise, or because it's cost prohibitive or something else. Um, and figuring out where those like killer usages are within your specific workflows. Uh, the, the tools that we found to be helpful when building this, and, and we started this process a little while ago. So uh, this is back when Llama Index wasn't as, uh, as fully formed yet. And I, that is something that we're looking into a lot more these days, Llama Index. We're also looking into um, a lot of the, the tooling that uh, y Labs has so like Lane Kit is something that is really interesting to us. It is uh, we because we are concerned mostly at this point with having the computer generate uh, correct syntax. Uh, it is a, a a pretty interesting problem that uh, it requires its own uh, set of testing for. We've had to develop a lot of our own unit testing framework, but we are trying to standardize and systematize this as much as possible. Um, I think the but what we started out with, though, was uh, like ChatGPT, uh, it was Langchain, and it was vector databases. And now, because things are moving so fast, we're, we're kind of questioning and trying to uh, you know, stay up to date with everything that's going on and figuring out what the right tools are at this very moment. Uh, and it's, it's an exciting spot to be in, but there's also so much. It can be overwhelming trying to figure out, should we rewrite everything uh, or you know, should we try this other model? And there are definitely solutions there. There are, there are ways that people are going about testing different models and figuring out which large language model works better for this or that. But it, it's a lot to, uh, to manage if you're coming from a domain specific perspective, like we are, like we, we are not just building generic chatbots or generic large language models. We are doing them within the context of computer vision. Um, and it, it is a process. And the advice I would have for anybody out there is uh, be prepared for a lot of messiness. Uh, don't think that it's all just gonna work out of the box. And it, it's a lot of elbow grease. No matter how you slice it, it's a lot of elbow grease. I feel like that's when I talk to most people working with LLMs, it's kind of the phase of the industry that we're in right now, like uh, especially when you're integrating all these things together. Can I ask, um, have you done probably a lot of like prompt engineering around models that you're using in there um, or are you using fine tuning and kind of ha what like... Do you have any advice around that, like thinking about prompts specifically in, I know in this case it's context around computer vision, but um, like how how did you improve prompts over time? That's something that people always ask. And that's something like you had mentioned LangKit, which is our open source library at YLabs, um, something where, you know, trying to build is um, an interface that can help you with those prompts and stuff like that. But it's still a learning process. Like when I talk to everyone in the industry, everyone has a different kind of way that they've done it um, and like how to measure if it's worked better or a lot of people just 
do it and they hope it works better. <laughs> what what has what have your what has your experience been um on that side of things so far? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And we certainly have not figured this out 100%, but the way that we've been approaching it is we've been treating code, like core code changes to our uh, like our, our entire framework, this, the, the entire pipeline that we're going through, as well as changes to the prompt infrastructure, um, all as the same. And we have one unit testing framework where we have a bunch of, uh, I think we've got like 50 unit tests that we think are pretty representative of the types of things that we're getting uh, queries from our users. Uh, and we know what the outputs should be. So even within our query language, there are multiple syntactically distinct correct ways to actually write an expression. Uh, so you, you can do things in multiple ways as you know, in Python, anybody who knows, like anybody who's Python knows that you can do that. Uh, and then what we have to do is we need to actually construct the data set effectively corresponding to that query uh, and then you know, scour the data set and figure out if the two data sets that are generated by the desired query and the generated query are the same. So that is part of the, the unit testing framework that we have. And we have these things graded. Um, like we, we know like you know, them tagged according to like what type of thing they are, what, what specific piece of the query language they're, they're touching um, and how difficult we think those queries are. And every time we make a change, you know, we run it against these unit tests. So this this is something that we, this is what we found works best for us. I think eventually we probably will want to, uh, you know, differentiate between prompt changes and, uh, you know, core infra pipeline changes. Uh, but the the distinction or the, the decision for us to not use fine tuning was actually one of cost. Uh, so, you know, the the cost to run the model is not that much higher if you're doing fine tuning. I think it's like 2x, at least when we were looking at it, it was roughly 2x. And that's fine for us. Like we we are fortunate to be in a position where we can pay that cost and it's not going to break the bank for us. But as an open source company that was developing this as an open source application, we were sensitive to the, the, the cost preferences of our users. And we built this in a way that it can be integrated directly into the open source app and the users would use their own uh, API keys. So we wanted this to be something that was as affordable as possible for the users. And that, that's the reason that we did not go in the fine tuning direction. That's awesome. And that's a really one. I feel like one of the better answers I've had when I've talked with people about how you're testing and stuff like that, like you have, a, it sounds like a pretty good testing framework around, around it. And uh, yeah, I think I'm, and some people who do use fine tuning um, often all also are doing prompting. Um, which I mean, I feel like everyone kind of is, you're telling your model how to behave. And it's like you're saying cost wise too, it's, you know, way more affordable. You could try like 10 different prompts, you know, even at the same time and compare those results and stuff like that. Um, whereas fine tuning can take a little bit of time. Sometimes models uh, don't even have the fine tuning capability right now. If you're using something like sure, GPT-4, sure. I don't think that's quite out. It might be for some people, but um, not for everyone. And um, all right, so uh, we've talked a lot about some exciting applications of LMs and computer visions and how you're working with it. Um, uh, I would love to hear way more about uh, Voxel 51 and what you've been working on there. I know we've teased it a little bit, uh, but I want to kind of hear way more about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and just to clarify, do we have how much time do we have left? I want to make sure that you know, uh, it is up to done. you so I can keep going further. I know I put on your calendar something like 30 minutes, <laughs> um, but if okay. you want to go over, sometimes these will go over, you know, 40 minutes to an hour or something like that. Uh, but this is really up to you. Great, great. All right. I've, I've got some time. Uh, my company, we're, we're on our uh, like you know, all hands in person retreat right now. So everybody's just uh, recapping the board meeting right now. So I'm, I'm good. I'm good to go. Uh, so Voxel 51, as I mentioned, we're all about data curation, helping you to build higher quality data sets. Uh, not an annotation company. We integrate directly with a bunch of annotation companies, Labelbox, Label Studio, Scale, CVAT, uh, and a lot of our customers use those integrations. Uh, so we, we are not the place you go to uh, actually annotate your data. We're the place you go to understand those annotations, to correct annotation mistakes, and to uh, do a, like, a model training feedback cycle loop, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, the way that we see ourselves is 
infrastructure for a lot of people to do their machine learning and data science stuff. So we build the, the tooling that helps people to do machine learning better. And sometimes machine learning is a part of that. So we, we do have machine learning capabilities inherent in the infrastructure that help people to understand their data better. But in other ways, it is a pure engineering project. So there are, there are ways in which like we, we really try to make it as scalable as possible. So we put a lot of engineering effort into uh, making sure that people can get to hundreds of millions or a billion samples as a lot of them want to. And there's ways in which we want the, the rendering to be as fast as possible. People to be able to use this, uh, whatever device they're on. Um, but from the machine learning, from the computer vision and integration with large language models perspective, the things that we're working on these days are uh, trying to enable people to understand their data better using large language models. Uh, so we, we built in these vector search integrations so people can, using natural language uh, with a multimodal model like Clip or, or Blip or something like that, but like that they can uh, basically search through their data uh, and they can find images or video frames that uh, you know fit the the uh, like the, the sentiment or the, the concept um, that they are searching by. And we we have integrations with these vector search tools, Quadrant, uh, uh, Pinecone, LanceDB, Milvis, uh, in, in order to make that happen. Um, but we've also integrated vector search stuff into the large language model stuff. So basically, people can now use natural language queries in order to ask questions about their computer vision data sets and get an answer back. And this is still something that is in progress. It is, it is constantly growing and evolving, but you know, suppose that you don't really know the exact query language that we have, or you don't know exactly how to get the subset of data that you're interested in, uh, but you want to do something like find all of the high confidence false positive in your data set. Now you can do that by just asking that question. The, the query language that we have combined with large language models enables you to just ask that question in natural language within the app and you can see it turns that into code and then it shows you those specific samples in the app just automatically. And it can do this with queries that it hasn't seen before. It can do this uh, because it understands your data format. So it will actually look through the labels. It'll look through the, the fields and attributes on your data and it will use those um, in addition to computations you run on your data in order to generate the specific query and then actually evaluate that to give you the subset of your data. So that's that was the first step. The second step right now is now that it understands the query language, it has access to your data in a certain sense. It, it basically like we gave it API access to your data set. Now, what can you do with that? Well, the goal now is to create these edits of your data set en masse and you know, imagine if you want to replace all dogs with cats across your entire data set, or you have uh, a specific person that you want to insert into them in an appropriate uh, pose or an appropriate orientation into every data set, uh, every image in the data set, or you only want to change certain things in certain places. You want to change uh, every one of the daytime scenes to nighttime scenes, or you want to build a data set iteratively or constructively where you have a certain number of images, and you know that this data set is not actually the as good as it could be in order to be a training data set for a, a model in the future. So the goal here is to use this query language understanding uh, in addition to some other tooling in order to help you to build these data sets out to do what you want them to do. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there, but th th that's what we're doing. That is awesome. Uh, I like I I'm so excited to um go in and, and use that myself. And this is something that's out right now, right? People can go sign up. Again, link is in the YouTube description if you want to go check out Voxel 51. Uh, but they can go and, and use Voxel GPT right now, right? Absolutely. So uh, if you go to try.51.ai, you can for free in your browser use Voxel GPT. Uh, we have some example data sets in there, um, things like Coco, um, as well as uh, like Berkeley Deep Drive data set, and then some more recent data sets because we, we work with people who are putting out data sets like every day to get their data sets in there. And you can ask questions either about your data set, any data sets in there, um, about computer vision more generally, or about the 51 documentation uh, because as this kind of, you know, table stakes these days, we, we gave it access to all of our docs and, of uh, and now it does like, it answers questions about them with code and then it gives you the links 
even to the specific places in those documents at the end of the, the answer. Uh, so you can do this all for free in your browser. Uh, this uses like our API key and we've got security measures in place so people can't actually abuse it. Uh, but then if you wanna use this uh, on your own, if you have 51 downloaded, you can install the Voxel GPT plugin. Uh, and plugins are a big part of how we're enabling all of these like in mass data set edits that, that, that I was talking about. But install the plugin. If you have your API key as an environment variable, uh, then you're good to go. And Voxel 51, I believe, is uh, out on GitHub for people to go look at too, yes. right? So give Voxel them a star. 51. <laughs> Voxel 51, uh, we are our repo 51, totally open source. Uh, we we pride ourselves on open source contributions. Anybody, if you, if you want to give it a star, that would be great. If you want to contribute to it, that's also great. Uh, if you're interested in attending any of our events, you know, we're, we're happy to have you just come join our community. Uh, there's a lot of overlap and alignment between the like R2 AI community and the Voxel 51 community. Absolutely. I, I definitely is. Um, and I, I love the use case you were describing too, of like using natural language to find these certain use cases um, and then using um, other tooling to to generate kind of like these, uh, uh, would you call it a synthetic data set in some cases? Like if you're, you know, changing brightness or tonight or adding people in um, to images, it'd be like a synthetic data uh, um, generation to get these images or, or data that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Exactly, exactly. And instead of having to go in by hand and, and do that, uh, I've, or I've done that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, this you know, it, and it's not just large language models. I think that that's you know an important thing to, to clarify here. Language language models are only a piece of this. There, there's also other recent advances in data set generation uh, that have made this possible, um, as well as, again, a lot of just brute forcing and traditional engineering that goes into this. But language models are an essential piece in making this happen. Brute forcing will never go away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome uh, to hear about that. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or connect with uh, Jacob and the other places linked in the description, because I know we're a little over time here. Um, before we go, I always like to ask, are there any other current trends uh, or advancements outside of LMs in this case, uh, maybe also computer vision, any other thing in kind of the ML data space that that you're really excited about that you didn't get a touch on today? Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to keep up with everything. Uh, I, I certainly am missing a lot. I, I try to stay up to date on papers with code and you know archive and all that good stuff. But I think something which is not necessarily new right now, but I'm I'm excited to see where people can take it is Laura. Um, so for those of you who who don't know, um, Laura is a fine tuning, or in some cases, people are actually using it to just train from scratch data sets now uh, or, or models on, on data sets. Um, and it is a technique of low rank adaptation matrices. So it can be, you know, depending on that specific application, anywhere from like you know, 7% down to like 0.1% of the model parameters as, as the original model uh, that need to be trained in order to get something that allows you to isolate a particular concept or a particular uh, something else. And I, I'm super excited to see where that goes. Um, it was originally proposed, if I recall correctly from the paper, for the context of language models, and it's already been used in a lot of vision-related contexts. Uh, I'm excited to see how people use that, how these LoRa models uh, are actually um, productionized. In, in, in So, so the, the thing that's cool about them, one thing that's really cool about them is that then you don't need to have a bunch of large models for each concept that you want. You can just have the base model, and then you can have the little LoRa modules, which are tiny, for each concept. And so you could essentially have this plug and playable fashion, uh, like, like multi concept, multi capability model that allows you to do a lot of really cool things uh, that is able to be deployed in a Docker container uh, you know, pretty cheaply. Uh, so I, I'm super excited to see where that goes and then how people continue developing that. That sounds cool. I haven't actually looked into that. So I'm, I'm definitely going to after uh, we wrap up our stream. <laughs> awesome. Um, is there anything else you want to share um, about, you know, work, anything going on at Voxel 51, any upcoming events? By the way, there's an upcoming event in the description if you're watching on YouTube. Um, any other upcoming events you have or or just any other topics you think would be interesting you want to throw out before we wrap up the stream? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, uh, 
I, I will double down on the events. Uh, so Sage has very kindly uh, agreed to come to one of the meetups that Voxel 51 helps to put on. Uh, so these are not Voxel 51 or 51 themed meetups. They are general computer vision and machine learning AI meetups. Uh, we, we've been doing one in computer vision for the past, I think, nine months now. We've got 5,000 people in that group. And then we're also uh, just starting to... Uh, take over a 10,000 person general AI machine learning meetup. And Sage is going to be uh, part of one of these, which is, which is tremendous. Uh, we have these every month. Uh, so if anybody wants to join them, please join. Uh, also, you know, we are looking for speakers always. Uh, we, we do these, we, we just want people to, to be a part of this. It's not our meetup. Uh, it is a meetup that we just help to make happen. So it is a community run meetup. Uh, the other event that we are having is a Voxel 51 themed event. It is next Wednesday uh, at 9 a.m. Pacific time. We're having our first office hours uh, and we're going to be doing this every month from now on. Uh, and you can just come by at the virtual office hours. Um, just, you know, come into the, the Zoom or I think it might be Google Meets now given Zoom's new terms and conditions uh, and ask whatever questions you have about 51, Voxel 51, anything. Uh, you know, we'll have members of our team there to answer. That's awesome. And I'll also just quickly mention, it's not just me at the other meetup. You have two other awesome sounding speakers. So it's not just uh, me coming and talking there. You have really cool people uh, speaking every month at your meetup. <laughs> awesome. So uh, someone said they recommended a speaker in the comments as well. You might want to check that out later. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and wrap up the stream. I know we're well over time. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Jacob. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, make sure you give... 51 by, Vox, uh, by Voxel 51, a star in GitHub. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, go check out all the really cool work they're doing. And, and thank you so much for coming on and sharing your excitement about combining LMs with the computer vision and also giving us some really cool practical knowledge if uh, people kind of want to go um, start building their own applications, combining those two things. Thanks so much, Sage. It was a pleasure being here. Um, it was really privileged. Um, and everybody should also star all of the Y Lab stuff, Langkit, <laughs> everything else. Go for it. We have two libraries, Y Logs and uh, Langkit. You can find them if you Google them. Uh, all about data logging, one for uh, large language models and stuff. But uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much <laughs> for giving us a shout out as well. And I'm going to go ahead and hit end on the live stream so it can take a minute. And sometimes it'll be slightly awkward for those 30 seconds or whatever while it's ending. So.